All right, it's so exciting to be at this kind of um, conference. Uh, it's an unusual group of people and an unusual opportunity to talk about some of the aspects beyond our research. Um, it's fun to be in a development section because we do technically actually do research on development, but from a very biophysical standpoint. So we're interested in how genes come on and off to pattern the Drosophila blastoderm embryo, which here you can see is like a giant, giant rainbow rotating football. Um, I'm not going to talk about our science much today, except to give this sort of broad overview of our, of our question, which is, you know, how is it that gene expression programs can be so precise and robust in the context of development, and yet also so plastic in the context of evolution, right, which is that these programs get rewired in order to build um, organisms with very different types of morphologies. This is, you know, real old school field biology. These are insects called tree hoppers, these weird, things on their heads, <laughs> um, this one looks like an ant to try to mimic um, ants for predators, are actually built of modified wing programs. Right, so you take the same circuitry and you rewire it a little bit and you get all this sort of different um, behavior morphologically out of these insects. So we have this little mnemonic in the lab, which is that we like to say that gene expression is precise and plastic. And here we mean that it's precise in the sense of an individual species and how it develops, but it's also very plastic over evolutionary time. And I realized, in putting together this talk that I can use exactly the same mnemonic for how we think about mentoring, which is that good mentoring is also precise and plastic. And by this, I mean that it's precise, it's targeted to individual people in the lab, and it's plastic in the sense that it evolves over time because everybody's needs evolve over time in the lab. And so what I really want to do today is focus the rest of my talk on um, mentoring strategies and lab culture in my group and some of the strategies that we've, we've used in my lab. So this is my lab in our most recent annual lab photo, which you may notice is inspired by the Dutch Masters exhibit at the MFA, except um, these are a lot of paper doilies. Um, and so <laughs> I... I put this up to start with because um, I think it's important to remind ourselves, um, myself in particular, that these people in my lab are almost exclusively trainees, right? They are postdocs and they are students. And they have accepted an exchange of low pay and long hours for, for, for professional development, right? And I take that mandate very seriously. I'm a professor, I'm a teacher. It means my job is to help educate these people in my group, right? And so I think that you know, it's important to think about what are the kinds of environments in which people grow and flourish and develop and do their best work. And while everybody looks you know, pretty serious in this picture, although maybe you can tell that they're having a good time, there's also this version of this picture where they were like, Angela, you look really mean. You look mean and we're all gonna look happy. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> They're actually having a pretty good time in the lab, and this is despite the fact that science, I would say, is 90% frustration and failure, right? It is a hard road, <laughs> and it's not just a hard road in the long haul. It's a hard road in the short haul. There's frustrating, irritating stuff that happens every single day, and so, you know, when I think about what my goal is as the leader of this group, I see it as shepherding people through their time in my group, helping them to attain relevant skills so that they can move on, because they're all signing on for a temporary period of time. And I want them to not only have the professional skills that they need, but I want them to not be burnt out, right? I want them to have enough resources and inspiration to move on to their next job with some energy. Um, and so my strategy is to build a supportive lab culture that can um, buffer the impact of all of these frustrations and failures, and um, to really prioritize individual mentoring, not just for me, but also from all of the other people in the lab, so really uh, incorporate a sort of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring strategy. And so why am I talking about this at a conference on gender diversity and sort of gender issues in science? And part of the reason is because I believe that this is where I personally, right now, today, can affect the leaky pipeline. So this is a place where, by my personal conduct in my lab and the values that we establish in my lab, I can help individual people persist in a hard career. 
Um, one of the things that I've learned, not only through my own personal experience, but also by prioritizing mentoring and learning from my trainees' experience, is that I think a lot of the cultural issues in science, while they may disproportionately affect women, um, actually are just quality of life issues for pretty much everybody. And so um, it's been in enormously gratifying to think about this problem um, from just a general how to make life better for people in science kind of perspective. All right, so I started my lab eight years ago and I realized while putting together this talk that when they asked, you know, we could tell a little bit about our personal background, that there was actually my background goes and how it's relevant for mentoring actually goes back a long, long way. So I grew up in Santa Cruz, California in the 1970s. So I don't know if people know about Santa Cruz, California, but it was sort of a countercultural mecca of the day before it was a bedroom community for Silicon Valley. Um, and so um, here's a picture of me in kindergarten um, where I'm pretty sure you can tell it's the 70s. <laughs> um, <laughs> I totally wish I was this kid, um, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm this kid. <laughs> um, and so, <laughs> such good times. Um, so what was funny about growing up in Santa Cruz in the 1970s was that in my ultra progressive weirdo elementary school, they actually taught us conflict management. Um, and so what this really meant was taking personal responsibility for issues that were um, affecting you and not sort of using blanket accusations, right? So this was learning to use I feel statements when you begin to talk about problems. Now, these guys, myself included, we didn't get it right away and we used a lot of phrases like, I feel that you stole my blocks or <laughs> I feel that you are a jerk. Um, <laughs> but you know, eventually it actually did sink in. And um, what I realized when coming to manage a group of people was that this whole toolkit of effective conflict management, which had been sort of in my toolkit, you know, since I was wearing patchwork pants, um, was actually enormously useful because conflict didn't intimidate me. Um, and so, and it wasn't, there wasn't some magic to resolving conflict. There was actually like very concrete strategies that you could use. And so that was one of the things that we sort of, I began to think about how could I sort of teach these things in my group. Um, the other really enormous influence was my mom. Um, this is my mom, um, who is a social worker. And so my mom worked with abused children and families at risk and eventually was head of all adult family and children's services in our county. And she was an incredibly effective social worker and a really beloved manager. Um, and the thing I learned from my mom was that you never, ever build effective relationships with people unless you approach them with mutual respect and the basic idea that everybody is a good person doing the best that they can. And so, you know, th this is an incredibly powerful message for you know, working with at-risk families, but then she also translated it into how she worked with her colleagues as a manager. So as a manager, she saw her job as enabling the people on her team. She did not see herself as a dictator. She saw herself as a facilitator. So her job was to understand, to tr trust her team implicitly, learn what they needed, and then give them what they needed in order to get their jobs done. So this sort of way of working that was inherently respectful and collaborative was also a thing that I didn't realize was a sort of ingrained part of how I thought about leading groups until I had to lead my own. And so when I started my lab, right, like everyone, I'd had many long years in science and I had some really wonderful experiences and some less than wonderful experiences. And one of the things that I had seen is that there were various times when it was very clear, like I had been rescued by an, you know, by an amazing mentor and it happened multiple times. And then I saw equally brilliant, promising people who had just not been rescued, right, who during some critical period in their career did not have somebody there to sort of see the shape of what was affecting them and to sort of usher them through um, these times, which I think everybody has of various shapes and forms. And so I really wanted to create a lab culture where hopefully you know, we could you know, rescue everyone, but also not in the grandest sense, but also in the smallest sense, right? In these sort of long-term challenges in science and the short-term challenges. 
I also was thinking a lot about the fact that for me, this sort of myth of the isolated genius, right, where you work all the time, sleeping under your desk, and never do anything else, and if you have any other interests, it's because, and they're taking away from your science, just was like never a personal model that fit me at all. Like, I love to do a bunch of other things. Um, if I don't do them, I become less creative and less inspired in my job. And so I really wanted to create a lab culture where that was okay, where people could bring their whole selves to work, right? And so my strategy was that I wanted to create this culture where people, you didn't just know about people's science, but you could sort of think about the context in which they were doing their science. So that meant knowing something about their personal values and their motivations, um, and that people could really do their work in an integrated way. And I hope that this would facilitate their resilience and their creativity and their ability to take risks um, scientifically. And um, again, I just want to emphasize that my, my personal experience, both you know, with my mom and through my progressive education taught me that there were a lot of things that you could do through social engineering to help this kind of goal, right? This wasn't just some sort of magic talent that people had or didn't have. You could do very specific things. So I wanna just share three sort of broad specific things that I think were very helpful when I got started. Um, the first one is this idea of leading by example, right? And so if I want people to bring them, their whole selves to work, I have to bring my whole self to work. So this means you know, if I have to pick up my kids at four, which I do today, <laughs> I admit that I have to pick up my kids at four. I don't pretend like my work life is some bounded box where there's no information about anything else that's important to me. I talk about my hobbies. I invite my lab over to my house. Um, we know each other as people. And, you know, this is a careful line to walk in your, in your work um, life. You know, you don't, especially as a leader, you don't necessarily share all the relevant personal details of your life, but enough that people realize that you're not, again, this sort of abstract superhero with nothing else happening in your life, I think at least my students and trainees tell me has been very important for them in realizing that they too could have a, a life that they sort of envision. Um, where the rubber really hits the road on this idea of leading by example is normalizing failure. So I'll tell a very specific story about this because I think it illuminates the general principle which is that when I started my lab, I felt like grant writing was an onerous task to be taken on only by me, right? I shouldn't burden anybody else with it. Um, I'd honestly never had a lot of failure in this area before. Like, I'd been on fancy fellowships all the way through stuff. Like, I'd write for things. Like, sure, I didn't get all of them, but I always got one, right? And then when I first got my lab, I just I was getting hammered on grants. It was totally demoralizing. And so, there was one specific grant, it was an R01, where I sent it in the first time and it got scored, and then I did all the things they told me to, and I sent it back and they triaged it. So it got worse. And I was, just, it was for about a week, I was just totally down. And my lab knew something was going on, but they didn't know what it was. And I walked into the lunchroom and somebody just asked really simply, like, are you okay? Like, you seem really sad. And I was like, woohoo! And I totally just, I, I just started crying. I'm a crier anyway. but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so they like listened to me and they were like, well, we could go through the reviews together. Like, we're happy to help. Let's see if we can all like think of other experiments or other directions. And they just kind of like jumped in. And it led to this new process in our lab whereby now we write grant, grants collaboratively, totally collaboratively, where me and two or three other people in the lab sit down from the brainstorming to the execution and we do it all together. And that sort of leads to this thing, right, which is to work collaboratively in the sense that my vision of grant writing as solely my responsibility um, actually was harmful in a couple of different ways. It was harmful because I was disproportionately burned by it, and it also didn't give the people in my group an opportunity to learn how to do it. And by, learning, by doing collaborative work in a deep way, from conception to execution to looking at the reviews all together, it just normalized out so many different things. Our grants are better, they do better. Um, they're fun to write, I get an, a chance to um, work deeply with the people in my group, and they reportedly really like it. So, um, and they're learning how to do it, so I think it's really amazing. Um, so, again, I just wanna say, like, these are three 
very sort of specific things that you as an individual can do right away to sort of start creating a bubble of supportive culture around you. You don't need everybody around you to be like this, but if you can find a few people to kind of play with you in this way, then you can start creating, creating culture really immediately. Um, let's return to this idea, right, how you make mentoring both precise and plastic. I'm not going to talk a lot about this in specific because we wrote an article about it as a lab that came out in Molecular Cell last year. Um, you'll notice we're all 10 co-first authors because we literally wrote it at group meeting um, at the urging of my trainees because the NIH was um, beginning to mandate having individualized development plans for all trainees. And we'd actually been doing this thing we called a yearly planning meeting every year since I started my lab. And my goal in starting it was exactly this idea of how can I tell whether I'm succeeding in get pe getting people where they want to go unless I know where they want to go. And so we sit down and the whole process is described in a lot of detail here. But the main features of it are that we first sort of celebrate successes that have already occurred, so like the year before. Um, and then we also uh, think about how to support particular weaknesses or like areas for growth. We set personal and professional goals every year, and we write them down on a timeline. Um, we focus a lot on how to give and receive feedback in this article, I mean, we talk a lot about it as a lab. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this stereotype that when men receive criticism, they tend to be like, that person's crazy, they don't understand my genius at all, right? And that when women receive criticism, they tend to be like, oh, I really should have done better. I, t I could have worked harder, right? So there's a big difference in how we externalize or internalize feedback. So we talk a lot in, um, in the lab about how to contextualize feedback and how to use it as a real gift instead of using it to beat yourself up as a, as a self-esteem um, issue. And then um, the last part of this, this whole process is actually that everyone gets feedback, gives and receives feedback, me included. So I give people in the lab feedback on how their work is going and areas there where I think could be improved, and they do exactly the same for me in terms of how our relationship is working and how the lab dynamics are working and stuff. So I want to just end with this famous quote from feminism, right? The personal is political. And so this quote was meant to say that your personal experience, right, is representative of sort of larger political structures or sort of cultural structures in um, society. And I would argue that we can actually update this to also include the personal is professional in the sense that um, doing your best work also needs to consider you as an entire person, right? And so this means not only that you as an individual need to be considered, but that your personal relationships with others in your workplace have an enormous impact on your productivity and your resilience um, in your career. Um, and also, I guess this is a little bit of a, of a stretch for here, but I think it's also really a call to arms for those of us in academics, because I think that you personally can make a lot of choices to affect the well-being of the people in your groups. Um, and by this I mean, you know, we have a lot of flexibility in how we establish the cultures in our groups. There are larger institutional rules, but there's a lot of flexibility in how they're implemented. And I wanna just give you one example, which is um, one of my postdocs, recently had a baby, and here she is, she's lovely, um, and um, her mom is a scientist and her dad is a scientist. Her dad is the one in my lab, and I told him to take paternity leave. Three months, take it all, don't come in, we don't wanna see you. And <laughs> we're like, you can come and visit with the baby, but, <laughs> but please stay home, and he was, happy to do it, and he reported back um, very happily when he got back, he wrote me the nicest letter, that because their daughter is equally comfortable with him and with her, his wife now feels no guilt or anything about traveling for her job, working late when she needs to, they're equal parents, and he feels very strongly that it was because he was allowed to bond with her as soon as she was born, and that they established a routine where both of them were equal parents. That's something that um, you can, you know, as a PI, I was able to do whether or not my institution told me that it was allowed or not. And so um, with that, 
I would just like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take any questions.